So if you've been following professional cycling for many years, the name Genevieve Johnson may mean many things to you. A wonderkind who achieved tremendous success from an early age, winning world championship titles as a junior on the road and time trial. It may mean years of EPO use. It may mean the victim of abuse, multiple types, mental, physical, even sexual, as a teenager, as a young teenager at the hands of her coach. It may mean doping violations which led perhaps ironically to a sense of relief and freedom but turns out Genevieve Johnson is more than a name and headlines is an actual person one of whom of whom I'm uh, grateful to be able to speak with today how are you I'm I'm well thank you good to see you now where are we tell people where in the world we are yeah we are in upstate New York uh, in uh, Watertown which is right below Kingston for fellow Canadians <laughs> Uh, about three hours from Montreal, and we are at the Northwind Classic First Edition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just did a shakeout ride on the beautiful roads around here. Genevieve has come back to cycling after many years away, and that's part of what I want to talk to you about, is what brought you back, what you get out of it now. You know, often we see pro cyclists go one or two ways after retiring. Some keep riding their bikes forever, and some never touch the bike again, and that's without that's without many of the things that happened to you in your life. So I want to talk about that, but I also want to talk a bit for context about, you know, kind of your life story and what got you to this point. So, yeah, but just a simple question, like, how did you get into cycling? I, I was aware of you from, you know, your racing career once you're already at the high level of winning worlds and going to the Olympics and world championships and whatnot. How did you get into cycling and how were you connected with the coach that steered your career for so many years? Um, I started cycling, I was 11, and the only reason why I was, uh, my, my girlfriend at the time, in the, in the summer months, would want to go to the mall and McDonald's and just hang out, and I thought it was so boring. <laughs> so my dad had a bike in the garage, and it was way too big for me. It was one of the, those old Peugeots, mm -hmm. probably a 60 frame, <laughs> and I was like five foot one, and I somehow got over the bike and start pedaling. And the, the town I was living in, um, La Chine, has a really nice bike path. So I could go on the bike path and it would be safe. And I liked it. I liked the feeling of riding. Um, and a part of me liked the idea of com competition mm -hmm. uh, without really knowing what it was. So I started riding and um, yeah, I, I was hooked. My first little race was a Criterium, which went terribly bad because you don't have any skills, right? Uh -huh. But I was not bad at the, at the time trials. And uh, I got, yeah, I got better. It was fun. And how I met my coach, um, I was 13 and the cycling team I was in had a coach, but he got a real job and mm -hmm. couldn't really take care of the cycling team. So I was kind of on my own and uh, the coach was a phys ed teacher working in a bike shop in the summer months. Mm -hmm. So one day I, I arrived there, I needed something fixed on my bike and we started talking and he said, you know, if ever you want some training programs, uh, I can do that. Mm -hmm. So it was the, the first solution that I got was meeting him. Mm -hmm. So I said yes and I started training, I was 13. so. Uh, you know, the races. Actually, in Quebec, the, the system in Quebec is pretty well developed. Uh, we had like maybe five or six weekends of three races, a road race, a time trial and a crit. And then we had the Quebec championships. So I was busy. Um, and that's how I met him and how I started. So it, age 13, 14. Yeah. I and yeah, quickly had huge success. Yeah. Right? Um, I... I <laughs> I like to remind myself that I won many races without mm -hmm. any doping. Mm -hmm. I won uh, the national championships uh, in the juniors when I was still like cadet. I was 15, but racing in the upper and the other category mm -hmm. uh, against girls like two years older than me. And I won the road race and the time trial. And that was, you know, without any doping. So because I remind myself of that. Because it's really hard when you've been doping for your whole career to try to imagine how good I would have been. Sure. And sometimes I doubt. Sure. I'm like, was, that, was I really good? 
or you know and there's other cir circumstances that maybe you can talk later but so i remind myself of that to say yes i was good mm -hmm. you know i was winning i was mm -hmm. winning yeah, I mean, that's, yes, miss some things you'll never know. Some clean people will never know what it was like to dope, and some people who dope never will be able to separate the two. You know, you hear some people, uh, I've heard some professionals joke somewhat crassly about clean writers who were never good enough to, to dope, like they never got to a level where they had to make that choice mm -hmm. one way or the other. I'm curious, when, when did that... When did doping come into the picture for you, and was it presented as a choice, and or was it presented as like, here's the next thing, here's the next thing? That's an excellent question, and it's a sequence of events. So, when I was 15, that's when the sexual abuse started, and immediately followed by, I'm in love with you, uh, if you leave me, I'm going to commit suicide. Followed on his part. On Not, his this part, is, yes, exact. This, yes. Uh, if, uh, you know, if you leave me, I'm going to kill you and then I'm going to kill myself. I don't care. And so at 15 and I'm winning, I'm winning the national championships and everything. But because of the sexual abuse that I can't tell to anybody, not right. my family, you know, I'm super ashamed of that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a burden I'm, I'm, I have on my shoulders that. I'm thinking, I, I don't know how to deal with it, so I'm mm. just going to try to forget it and deal with it later. But during that season, I won everything. The only reason I didn't go to the World Championships, uh, the Junior World Championships, is because I was 15. And they, they don't accept, like, the cadet age at the World Championship. You really mm. have to be racing under the junior uh, age. Mm -hmm. you know? Just 90. Well, Eight or what? That you? was 97. 97. Yeah, okay. 97. Okay. So for the following year, the coach decided to take a sabbatical from work. So no pay. He still has a mortgage. He still has, you know, bills to pay, a car payment and everything. And he told me on that year, he said, you know, we really have to train super hard because now I'm taking, because of you, I'm taking a year off to take care of you. Mm -hmm. and to bring you to the next level, mm -hmm. but you have to pay me. You know, I can't live on air, so mm -hmm. we need money. Mm -hmm. And to need money, you need performance, and you need sponsors and everything else. So now I'm 16, and we discovered I was anemic, uh, and the only really way to treat anemia is rest, and then, of course, you increase your iron intake and everything else, but it's really reducing the training load and then letting your body recover. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, you know, now I don't have a job and uh, there's no way we can spend a whole season with, without having performances because you're not going to get any sponsors and next year it's not going to work. So you need to be healthy and we're going to go see that doctor and he's going to give you that and that's it. Mm. But the abuse continued during all that time and it, you know, it kind of grew during that time too. And now I'm also responsible for his financial situation. And I just didn't know what to do. And I didn't want to get beat. I took the least decisions or the decisions I was taking was to buy me some time that I would not get hurt. Mm. So when he got me to the doctor, I just, I, I took it, mm. you know. I, at, at 16 year old, uh, you don't know, uh, you don't have any reference point. Um, and I was really isolated. I didn't tell that to my parents, of course. So, and it started like that. Mm -hmm. And after that, I mean, they, they can tell you, oh, it's just going to be for this one time. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be healthy and then we're going we're gonna to let that go. Mm -hmm. But it's not. Mm -hmm. So from 16 on, uh, <clears throat> it was constant. So that was another secret that I had. And that kept me from, you know, growing in other areas too. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, the success is continuing to come, not just at the junior ranks, but you quickly make the jump to the pro ranks and you're racing in Europe, you're, you're winning races. So what I have here is, at least according to my chicken scratch notes, is 2003 Worlds was the first time you failed a, a blood test, which suggested EPO. Yeah. Was that correct? So that yeah, was the first correct. time? 
so uh, my hematocrit levels were high. Yeah. So they they stopped me from racing. They gave me a vacation of two weeks. Okay. And yes, that tells you like something is wrong with this person. Yeah. And did that? What was the reaction for yourself and for your coach and for those around you at that point? Was that an alarm system that hey maybe this is all about to come crashing down or is this like oh we just need to be more careful? What was what was your thinking and what was your coach saying at the time my thinking I well first of all I couldn't believe I was there um, I was extremely uh, I'm now I'm thinking just in French in my head so the words <laughs> don't come but I was destroyed inside from that uh, I had you know it was in Canada my whole family it mm. was a secret so now I mean mm. I had a doubt on myself and the coach didn't care he was like they're all a bunch of assholes and they can say whatever they want but they don't know and we're just going to continue doing it anyway and I was thinking to myself oh my god you know it, that this is going to keep going he doesn't care but he always had that sense of you know I'm going to fight against anything and everybody else but me is they're wrong mm -hmm. so for him it was not a problem it was just a two-week break and then we would continue mm -hmm. for me it was different but then again it's the living situation i was in i was in with him that i couldn't get out of and express myself or go get help because and what kept me there for so so long was that one, I didn't want him to commit suicide, and I really thought he would. Hmm. Now, I mean, at 42 years old, I know he would not. But when you're in it, and you know, when you live daily abuse and daily physical violence, and it hurts so bad, you think he's gonna be able to kill you, hmm. you know? It, it was right there, so, um, so I just continued to do what he, what, he wanted. Were you speaking to other writers about this at all? Like, you know, another frame of reference, at least for many American fans, is the Postal Service, because like, you know, similar trajectory, early 2000s, and there were, you know, it was a whole concerted effort of a team, and so that was, in some ways, uh, gave like a sense of camaraderie. It was like us against them, and you know, often that team suspected that well, all the other teams are doing it, so. It was some, it was secret to the public, but it wasn't just one individual, you know, doing that. What was? Did you have any other writers that you were speaking to? It was just. It was just, it was just me just, and the coach. Yeah. yeah. May, and that's I think, the the U.S. Post, postal uh, Lance Armstrong model of doping. Yeah. This is what we remember in society, and this is what, is a bit harmful for people like me, because. In doping, it's not just a Lance Armstrong U.S. Postal model. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a ton of different situations. A lot of situations of athletes are going to take performance-enhancing drugs because, because they were pressured and because they had no choice. It's not, it's not all U.S. Postal model, uh, but everything in our society and in sport right now, the anti-doping and the federations and everything else is based on this image mm -hmm. you know they don't go case by case they don't go and ask the athlete that tested positive like what happened you know i'm i'm so sorry this happened to you but we need to understand you know they don't have these conversations well they're starting that's not true they're starting to do because i did uh, i did a lot of projects with the wada and everything about my story and they really are starting to go deeper mm -hmm. in the doping culture um but I wish that would be more prevalent in the way we, we treat anti-doping, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Sure. Uh, so yes, for me, yes, I had a team with, uh, with teammates and everything, but I was always in my own condo with the coach and the girls had, you know, their, their condo. And that's sad because, you know, in bike racing... So, same team. Same thing. You're living with the coach. All the other teammates are in a different place. Yeah, yeah. That's, because of the doping products. Yeah, clearly unhealthy un <laughs> in retrospect. I mean, red flags, everybody. <laughs> but sure. no one, you know, no one told me. Mm -hmm. So, 
Um, and your parents, what was their perspective about They didn't this? know because I left for the United States, per not permanently, but most of the months I was in the United States. I left, I was 16, mm. 16, 17. Mm. And you can be sure that when I came back to Montreal, I put my best face on for my parents, mm -hmm. you know, because I didn't want them to be afraid. I didn't want them to take me out of the sport that I liked. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, even in the midst of all this abuse and horrible stuff, I still loved riding my bike mm -hmm. to a certain to a certain timeline, time point, a uh, frame. Uh, uh, but for the longest time, I, I, I liked riding my bike. Sure. A couple other dates. 2004 was a Miss Test Flesh Wallone. Yes. 2005, you won Canadian Road Nationals again. Mm -hmm. Won Tour de Tuna. Uh, probably won a bunch of other things that year. Uh, and then tested positive for EPO and an out of competition test. And then 2006, USADA gave you a two year ban. You've since talked about how that was a relief of sorts. What was that your initial reaction? Or what was, that what, was, was what, what was your first reaction when you were told, okay, you're caught, you're done? That was, it was relief. And I was ashamed of it because I didn't want the, the coach to see it. But I didn't know how to get him out of my life. Uh, cycling, there was no way I could go see another coach because I was afraid he was going to commit suicide. And then you go to another coach and you don't have the EPO anymore. So you're going to have a period of time where your performances are going to do that. Mm -hmm. And the coach is going to be like, what's happening? Say That would have been a red flag. I couldn't go to my federation because going to my federation would have brought up the doping and would have brought up the abuse, which I was super ashamed of talking about. Not even the sexual abuse, just the violence I was going through. Uh, I couldn't go to the anti-doping agencies either because I would be banned. So I didn't have a way to get him out of my life. So I was thinking, well, if I have an accident, like not to die, I never wanted to die, but something serious enough that I'm gonna have to stop cycling. Mm. That could be like a way out. Mm. But I got my karma back and I got the positive test. So when I opened, when I saw the letter and my first initial reaction was like, oh, finally. But then, of course, you know, you're I was afraid and I was afraid of the public. And I understood what it meant for my career and for my family mm -hmm. that I had sworn to my parents that I would I was not taking anything. They believed me. So, you know, it hurt our relationship there. Uh, but yeah. Big relief. And then, and then what? What, what did you do for years after that? For so many cyclists, so many professional cyclists, I should say that there's often a identity crisis of sorts once they stop racing because they've been that's been so much of who they are for so long. That when they stop, it's it's difficult, and that's when they leave on their own terms. So, what was it like for you to once you had that sense of relief? Okay, I'm done. But then, what's next? Um, I think I was, I'm lucky in that way, in the sense that I, I have a fighting spirit and I would not let that situation win over my life. And I had, I always wanted to have a restaurant when I was cycling. Mm. It was some, a, a, a project that I wanted in my retirement. So now that, uh, you know, I tested positive, there's no way I can go back to Canada because mm. who's going to give me a chance? Who's going to want to work with me? Um, I'm, what, 23. I didn't really want to go back to school, so I have a high school diploma. I cannot really go to work because I don't have a university diploma or anything. And I was thinking, OK, working there or here, I mean, no one's going to want to see me in Canada. So I need a, to find a way to stay in the United States. And that was through buying a restaurant and having a visa to mm -hmm. stay in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I bought the restaurant and in Phoenix, Arizona, it was a diner, nothing fancy. Uh, but it kind of saved my life because it's the first time when I started working there as a server without knowing anything, people liked me. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know my story, they didn't mm -hmm. know what happened to me. 
Uh, and they came in the morning to get their steak and eggs and, you know, <laughs> talk to me about their kids. And, mm. and that made me think, okay, maybe I have a future. I have a way to make money. I have a way to, you know, have build myself something. And the, I, the coach was still in my life at that point um, because he was responsible for my financial situation and everything else I was doing, you know. So, but then when I understood that I could make money, I crafted a plan where I could flee him. I could basically like run away and then start a new life. So I did that and uh, I stayed in Phoenix until 2008, I think. And then from 2008 to 2012, I was in San Diego. I uh, kept working in the restaurant industry and also um, did a two-year massage therapy license certificate and a holistic health practitioner because I was thinking at that point I would like to go back to school, but I don't know what I want to do. And the, la the last time I sat in a classroom was at 16 years old and now I'm, all, you know, I'm 28, 29. I'm kind of rusty in my head. So I did massage therapy. Uh, I never used it, but it was the first step into going back to school. And then uh, in 2012, I came back to Canada to meet my parents mm. because I didn't really have a good relationship with them. For I didn't understand what they went through, and they they were super hurt that they let me go with him, and that I was never comfortable enough to tell them sure. what happened. Sure. So it was important for me to have a good relationship with my family and I left everything, all my life in the US and I came back to Montreal. And uh, now I'm 30 and I made the decision I would go back to school. So I'm sitting in school with 17 year old. I went to university, I, did, uh, I studied neuroscience in university. And uh, yeah, I started to build my life with that, like that, slowly. Yeah, just to tie a couple of not spec up on things there was some consequence for both your coach and for the doctor who was giving you epo it took years like these things often do but 2009 andre obut is that how correct yeah, his name Obu, yeah. obu. Mm -hmm. i cannot i'm a typical That's american fine. i can barely speak english much less french andre obu and uh maurice dr maurice duquette yep. uh were banned for life by the canadian center for ethics and sport uh, and then 2016, uh, Obut was arrested for domestic violence, not against you, but against his wife at the time. So. Mm -hmm. And that's going to sound like super weird to say, but it, it kind of, it was also a relief to see that he was arrested for domestic violence. Because even if I lived through it, sometimes I'm wondering, like, did I imagine all of this or... Was it really that bad? Was it really that bad? Yeah. Or mm -hmm. and then when I when I saw and I read the police report because I have a journalist friend in in, in Montreal that sent me everything. That's the one who broke the story, and uh, it's like, yeah, he's really sick. He's a sick person. Mm. So, but then after that, I got angry because I feel a little responsible. He's still out there. And I was thinking maybe I should reopen the dossier and bring him to court and everything. But for what? I mean. I'm going to go to the criminal court. Maybe he's going to get a month in jail or something like that, like something ridiculous. And if I bring him to civil court, I'm going to win what, say? So mm -hmm. I decided on that point that all the, the energy I have, instead of focusing my energy on getting him punished, I should take that same ball of energy and just focus on being better as a person mm. and work myself to be able to go through life healthy mm -hmm. and that's what I did but it's still it's still something that you know gets me sure. to this day. That makes sense. Mm. You've been working as a coach for a few years now mm -hmm. helping other people with fitness and and other things. You were telling me earlier as we were writing that you had some understandably negative connotations with the whole coach athlete relationship. Um, but how have you found working with other athletes now? Is that a rewarding thing? Is that a frustrating thing? Is that just a job at this point? Or it's, what is that like for you? It's really rewarding. And it's also understanding the human 
within the athletes and working with that. Uh, I find it fascinating. But what it reconnected within me is that most people, they do that for fun. Mm. You know, sport, <laughs> sport is fun. Uh, and that got me back to thinking, well, you know, Jen, you never really had fun or you don't remember what fun is yeah. when you ride your bike. So yeah. it would be like super sad if you end your career without knowing what fun is on a bike. Yeah. So that got me to think, well, I should, I should start competition again to you know, rewire my brain with yeah. everything. Yeah, it's a good segment. That's what I wanted to ask about is like how you, you came back in. One, I'm a U2 fan. One line that I like is, laughter is the evidence of freedom. And I've seen you laugh now and seen, you know, we, we've just met each other for the first time today, but, you know, followed your career for years and didn't see you laughing very much back when you were, you know, top of the world, mm -hmm. winning lots of things. So what was the draw back to, you know, if you had negative associations with coaching, you probably had negative associations with cycling. Why come, what pulled you back into cycling and, and what are you enjoying or what are you still having kind of issues separating uh, the past from the present now? Uh, that's a big ball of emotion. Um, but what brought me back to cycling is yes, the, the, the people I coach and also I, I'm, a, I'm a mentor for uh, young women professional cyclists that they too have fun in the hard training sessions. Um, so that gave me another perspective. And then, uh, like I just said, I need to close that loop and I've worked in therapy for so long you know, to, to be able to live a life free of that old cassette tape that my coach got me in, in, in my head. Mm -hmm. And with, with, with sports and with cycling in, in particular, I'm in charge of it. And I realized that the only power the coach still has on me is on that point. And if I want to be able to, to recreate my... Um, my associations, well, I'm an adult, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> so I started racing again, and oh my God, it's, it's tough. Uh, getting back to fitness is, is tough. Um, but I found... Because for years, you didn't ride a bike. Like when no, you, when you were I, working in the restaurant... I drank were, wine, I, I partied, I yeah. studied, and, but the bike was... Just, I'm, I was trying to, to get an identity... So I, be, I came back to racing. Yes. And what I found is my, the bike has such a different meaning for me now. And when I retired, when I got cut in, in 2005, I thought I was this like winning machine, you know, that beast on the bike. And... After that, you know, no cycling until 2022. I go back to racing. I still had that idea that I was a killer on the bike that always wanted to win and everything. But I understood, and that's just in the past months, in let's say the last six months, because I've been thinking a lot about it and, you know, always trying to figure out things in myself, that I think I, I won so much. Yes, I had my own motivation. I liked to be fit. Uh, but it's because I was afraid. I was afraid of getting beat if I didn't win. And there again, when you're, you have that fear motivator mixed with your, you know, your own motivation, I was trying to buy myself time that I would be happy and not get beat. Well, it's really easy to be angry on the bike and wanting to win races when you have like a lifeline or when you're going to have a, a consequence that you're going to be hurt, right? So when I came back to cycling last year and I was racing and I was thinking, how come I don't have that fire in me? Like, where's the fire that I wanted to attack? Or when someone would attack me, I would try to follow. Mm -hmm. I mean, now the girls, they can attack or they can, if I'm in the hurt locker le, and they pass me, I'm going to be like, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I don't uh, care. Uh -huh. But I was disappointed all last year because I couldn't find that fire. I still had in my head 
the the image of 2005. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to admit to myself that maybe, you know, I know I have fire in life because I went through everything I went through and I'm super healthy and I won. I won that battle. So I am a fighter. Mm. But maybe on the bike, I'm just, you know, I like to train. It's uh -huh. not really winning or the event that gets me going. I need the events in my life to get me committed to a training program that I love to do. But once the event gets here, like the race tomorrow, even if I don't race, I'm going to be happy. <laughs> it was the whole yeah. process of getting there. Yeah. So maybe I'm not that fierce competitor that I was back then. Maybe I'm just a person, a girl that likes to go super hard. And yes, I like to make my legs burn. But at some point, if you want to attack me and I like you and I don't want to go, I'm going to say, good job. Uh, it's yours. Uh, but I was ashamed of that. You know, I didn't want to mm. think that I was like that, but I mm. am. You know, I like to ride hard. And after that, well, I have a beer and mm -hmm. I'm going to start training tomorrow i'm not gonna rest for a race or i'm not gonna you know not say yes to a to a dinner with friends because i have their race the next day mm -hmm. so it's like it was admitting that sounds that to like myself. a healthy place to be and, and we yeah we should know that yeah when you came back to racing it was in part to do gravel racing mm -hmm. like all the kids are doing now and with the team floyd's of leadville floyd landis of course being another person in the U.S. Postal team situation that we talked about earlier. So yeah. how did that relationship come about? Like when you decided to come back to racing, you could have put it together in a number of different ways. Why go with Floyd's? It was my bike, my bike sponsor, okay. Squad, that told me, um, you know, there's this team that's going to be built and uh, they're going to ra they're, they're race the squad. So you should, I am going to put you in contact with, uh, with the management and uh -huh. then see. And, you know, Floyds of Leadville, they gave me a super great chance and they didn't care about the results. They wanted to have fun, uh -huh. which was what I wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got on the circuit with them and uh, last year was a lot of fun. I did some great events. And uh, this year I'm really involved in safe sport mm -hmm. uh, and other things. So I felt... Maybe you should briefly explain safe sport for people who aren't where this is yeah safe sport um is education prevention it's helping the whole of the sporting community in knowing what is a safe and secure environment for kids and for athletes to do their sport so what is abuse what is physical abuse mental abuse uh, verbal abuse sexual abuse um, you know, all that stuff and, and having tools for parents and coaches and officials and, and friends and family and everything. Uh, so, of course, that's a, that's a topic that's close to my heart. Sure. And, and, I can and, and, and framework that wasn't there for you. Exact. 15 years ago. Yeah, exact. Yeah. So, um, and I can speak from experience. So, I'm really busy with that. Mm -hmm. And I felt that it was not my my place to have a spot on a team because when you're on a team I I kind of want to perform and I want to be a, there for the races and stuff but now my schedule is so uh, shifting it's shifting so much with all these engagements that I didn't want to be on a team mm -hmm. so I decided to to make my own calendar and if I skip a race I skip a race and I'm not going to feel guilty about it you know mm -hmm. there's not someone waiting for me at the airport and uh -huh. that paid for a plane ticket it's my stuff so I decided to do that this year so what do you most enjoy about riding a bike now I mean you spoke to that a little bit but about having the importance of having an event on the calendar I think that's something a lot of us can relate to is that it doesn't necessarily matter what it is, just putting something out there. So, okay, I need to get off my butt and start training. And I, I did Leadville years ago, and probably my favorite thing about doing that was all the training leading up to it, of like riding on trails that existed forever, and I could have ridden any day, but I didn't think to do that until I had the goal and then started working my way towards that. So that makes sense. But when you get on the bike now, what's, what, do you, what do you enjoy about coming to events? Um... I enjoy the fact that when, because I have a full life now and I do different things, I can get on my bike and fix all my problems. 
you know, sometimes you're going to have a mountain in front of you and you don't find any solution. And then I get on the bike and I do my intervals. And then when I'm done, I have that solution. I feel like a rock star and I'm like, yes, I can do anything in life. So there's part of that. And I can experience that because I have a job and because I have the other stuff. But what the bikes or riding brings me the most is self-discovery. I'm really interested in knowing who I'm, who I'm going to be at mile 20 and who I'm going to be at mile 70 and who I'm going to be at mile 100 and 150. And that's why I love gravel, mm -hmm. because it's a whole journey where you're going to experience highs and lows and you're going to figure out stuff about yourself that you can't really necessarily do when it's a crit mm -hmm. and you're there for an hour. True. So it's selfishly, it's the human experience or the, the, the self-discovery mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. right now. And yeah, that's the most important. A few more questions, then I'll shut up and let you get about your, your evening. In the U.S. at least, it seems like there's, in terms of perception of athletes who doped and were caught for doping, some get lumped into the you're a bad person forever and some seem to almost get a pass in terms of public perception you know with the again just going back to the postal thing because that's a common reference like lance and floyd are in that camp and then some athletes on the same team like you know christian vandeveld or jonathan Botters, in public perception are still kind of golden boys do you one do you feel that's true of like this difference of perspective of people who had the same who were doing the same stuff and if so do you feel like you're put in either of those two I, camps yep uh, i definitely feel like i'm on the the camp that got forgiven hmm. um people have been extremely nice with me and i believe it's because the athletes that are in that pool are maybe more willing of sharing the, the truth or the real things, being more vulnerable and open and willing to discuss about it um, and maybe a bit less on the defensive. Mm. But for sure, for me, um, it's because also of what happened. Uh, if I would have kept that a secret, which I thought I, I would for the most of my life, I never thought I would speak about sexual abuse. I thought I would die with it, die with that secret. Um, so there's part of that, but I think it comes from the fact that if you want to be forgiven, even if I never did that to be forgiven, you need to be digging super deep into yourself and be willing to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and talk about the real stuff. Mm -hmm. Like Thomas Decker, mm -hmm. he's not afraid of saying the real things. No, no. Uh, his... And it's refreshing for me, you know? It was for me also his book, Descent, and I've read a lot of pro cyclist books and most of them aren't that interesting. That was fascinating and, yeah, honest. If you had to pick one word, mm -hmm. that was that from, yeah, across the board. And I think, <laughs> you know, that you bring, you bring up some, a good point. I think there's two camps also. Athletes that are going to get caught, they're not... Honesty, when you've been lying for so long, mm -hmm. at some point when you get caught, you go to different places. I promised myself that I would be 100% authentic and as honest as I can. Mm. Not, of course, to hurt someone else, but I, couldn't, I can't lie anymore. It's just <laughs> too hard. But there's these other athletes that for them, it's not as big of a deal. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, a difference there too. Mm -hmm. And Decker definitely falls into the honesty. Yeah. Uh, a bit like me. You know, say yeah. you want to get rid of everything. You want to yeah. cleanse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you get recognized now at races? It depends where. Yeah. I, I have the look like... <laughs> and then they continue. <laughs> uh -huh. This is a cliche question and impossible to know, but do you think cycling is cleaner now than it was 15 years ago? Um, I think they changed some of the rules to allow more stuff. Mm -hmm. if, is it cleaner? My personal opinion is no. 
but people have to understand that I, because of my background, I'm always going to have that bias. Sure. You know, I never knew the other side. May sometimes I look just with what I see, I see red flags, I see signs um, and I, that I can relate to me. Mm. So that's why I say no, but I can be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in some ways we won't know for another five, ten years. The cops are often a few steps behind. The yeah, waters. exact. One last question. Where do you see yourself in ten years? I can't answer that. <laughs> you don't I, have a crystal ball? I was no. hoping you could tell me the winning lottery numbers and what I should do with my life. And May, seriously, where you're gonna, okay. yeah. let me reverse that question to you. Five okay. years ago, mm -hmm. did you think you would be here? No. Uh, no. There you go. No. I, I have no well, idea. One year ago, I didn't know where I'd no, be. No, me I'd, neither. Yeah. So it's yeah. just, I think it's a matter of being open to opportunities and say yes. And say yes to stuff that it's kind of scary mm. and then you know you follow that path and if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out if you hate it you stop it and then you know you do something else but in 10 years <laughs> <laughs> I, hopefully I'll be happy and healthy and you know as involved in what I like as I am now mm -hmm. that's I think that's a that's a good goal but in exactly what field just a, who knows? Yeah, who knows? Well, we'll check back in in 10 years. Yeah, sounds good. Well, Genevieve Johnson, thank you very much for your time. Thank I enjoyed you, Ben. This. Thank you.